This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. This is what you can look forward to on episode 154 of Skywalking Through Neverland. Can we all take a moment to mourn what would have been an amazing addition to Sabine's Disney Infinity gameplay? I know more about sports than I do Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> it's got two. What? Two? Yes. Two. Two nominations. Ray in Snoke fighting and then Kylo Ren being in the middle and having to team up with one of them. <laughs> I didn't know you used the M word on the show. Oh, so cool. And that's where George created the Darksaber. It forms a complete sentence. The Force awakens the last Jedi. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Hello, Skywalkers. I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a mouse. You are skywalking through Neverland. Hey, hey, Skywalkers. Welcome to Skywalking Skywalking Through through Neverland. Neverland. We are the fun-filled Star Wars and Disney podcast that bring you entertaining stories from the creators and fans. And a big thanks and a giant Wookiee hug to our family of Skywalkers who listen to the show every week post on our Facebook group, and share the positivity about our adventure through fandom. And like always, a big thank you and a big shout out to all of our scope walkers and our Facebook watchers who are watching as we record. Now, I am Richard Woloski, your tour guide through fandom, and now everyone, please say hello to my universe, my sweetie wife, Sarah. <laughs> well, hello, Skywalkers. Hello, Star Wars fans. Hello, Disney fans. And hello, our family of fans. And once again, we love it when you tweet at us while you listen. We are at Skywalking Pod, and you'll be a tweet walker, as well as perhaps a scope walker or a Facebook watcher. Very nicely said. Thank you. All right, now we are recording this from Long Beach, California on January 24th, 2017. And here's a question, sweetie. I always ask you every episode for the last couple of episodes now. What time is it? It's time for me to switch my watch around. Every single time. It's 5.34. Good evening. (laughs) We're recording these later and later in the day. We are. All right. Well, coming up on this episode, we will be talking about last week's Star Wars Rebels episode with a focus on the Darksaber. Oh, love it. Yeah, we were all excited about Sabine's training with the Darksaber, but do we remember it in detail from the Clone Wars? And did Sabine ever talk with Bendu? Ugh, there's so much to talk about. Yeah, and there were so many holes to fill in that I know they can't fill it in while they're trying to put together a 22-minute story. But I really wanted to know more about the Dark Saber, and instead of going to 40 or 50 pages on online, we condensed it all all into one tight package, and we are joined by Jocasta Drew. Oh. Yes. Drew Kaplan, our our book reviewer here on Skywalking Through Neverland. Also, we're going to be joined by Tom Amin. He's back with us, and he's going to tell us all about his Disney-inspired album, Dreams Come True. Yes, he is a pianist and a composer, so it's really fun to hear his story. Yeah, and he was on our last... uh, He was on our episode 102 talking about Journey to the Stars when he did the same thing but with Star Wars. Nice. And Chris on Go Ma- Go Mouse Scout says, I love Tom Amin. Awesome. Yeah. What, a, what a great guy, too. Yeah. And we have shout outs, the Skywalker of the Week. And did you think we weren't going to talk about the new title for Episode 8, The Last Jedi? <laughs> well, we're going to talk all about that with our friend Tyler Westhouse from the Star Wars Podcast Alliance. And Sarah, what else will we be talking about? We're going to talk about a few Oscar nomination gripes, but also some exciting news from her universe. So get ready, you guys, because it's Things We Want to Share. Things We Want to Share. Things We Want 
to share. Things we want to share. Hey, hey, Tyler. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Of course. We figured that you would have a couple of things to say about the new title to Episode 8, The Last Jedi. Now, uh-huh. what, were you, what was your immediate reaction when you first heard the title announcement? Immediate reaction to The Last Jedi. I was very, very happy, and I was very... It, it got my hype up for the next film a lot more than The Force Awakens did. The Force Awakens was sort of... I didn't really have much of a reaction to it. The Last Jedi just seems perfect for what I hope they're going to do with the movie. I think it says like everything you need to know about what the movie's going to be like. Yeah. All right, before we get into that, Sarah, what did you think? When you, what was your immediate reaction when you first heard the title? My immediate reaction was, whoa, this sounds like an episode nine title. It just <laughs> sounds so final. You know, The Last <laughs> Jedi. And that's, that's my immediate, immediate reaction to it. Now, we can talk a little bit more later about you know, what the pre- thoughts were after that. But that was my immediate. Yeah, for me, since... So many fan films have had the word Jedi in them. Mm. My mind went to fan film. <laughs> That's funny. No, no it's not. <laughs> I don't want to think fan film. Well, actually, well, it is it a, is fan, a film. fan film because Ryan Johnson, as we all know, is a big fan. But when I first heard it, I thought, is this episode eight or is this announcement for another fan film all about Jedi? Oh, that's funny. All right. Now, Tyler, what do you, what do you think The Last Jedi mm. means? Oh, uh, man. I think... Uh... Well, what do you guys think The Last Jedi means? Because it's sort of been like a point of contention more than I really think it should be. It's pretty clear cut to me, but I want to know what you guys think about it. Oh, he's turning okay. the tables. Ooh. All right, Sarah, t- tell us what you think. Okay, The Last Jedi. I am a person who sees the glass half full. So I'm saying that The Last Jedi means The Last Jedi plural. So like Jedi can be plural or it can be singular. So I'm assuming that The Last Jedi is referring to Luke and Rey. Right. And then? Mm-hmm. And then maybe Leia. Well, that, that's all I'm going into. Like, I, I don't want to speculate too much. Right. But other than that, what do you think? Why, why is it called The Last Jedi? Well, it's kind of... So at the end of The Force Awakens, you see Rey meet Luke and hand him the lightsaber. So and we know immediately we're going to cut to that moment... And that's when The Last Jedi will begin. So for me, this, this is like the story of Luke and Rey and what they do on that island kind of as The Last Jedi. Okay. All right. All right, Tyler, you're up. Um, I really think The Last Jedi just, it really like solely means Luke. Because in the opening crawl for episode seven, it says like Luke Skywalker, comma, The Last Jedi. I think it's very clear cut that it's about Luke, and it's going to be Luke's movie. It mm. could turn into a, uh, <laughs> it could turn into a uh, more than singular meaning because I imagine Ray is going to become a Jedi in the next one. But I don't really think it pertains to Ray at the moment. I don't really think it pertains to Leia at the moment. I don't think Leia is a Jedi. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think they ever went into it, but I don't think she's confirmed to be a Jedi. I really think it's just going to be about Luke, and it's really going to be Luke's movie more so than anything else. I'm hoping and it's I think, not going to be Luke's movie because we want to see Ray's story. Oh no! I mean, I mean Luke's movie in the sense that, uh, like, uh, people talked about before The Force Awakens that it was going to be uh, Han's movie, and it was the movie that, like, for the original trilogy, Luke was sort of the. Uh, I mean, Han was sort of the star of the original cast in that movie. Oh, but I it, see. the movie, yeah, the movie really is about Ray and Finn and Poe. At the end of the day, Han is just a really strong supporting character. Um, I think that's what Luke is going to be. I imagine Luke's going to have like a Obi Wan Yoda ish role in there, but I don't want the movie just to be Luke kicking butt the whole time. I would like to see it primarily focused on Ray, even if that means we don't really see as much as like Finn and Poe. Mm-hmm. I would much rather see the uh, like Ray and Kylo Ren story told more than whatever <laughs> Finn okay. and Poe are going to be doing. Okay. So, so yeah. So what you're saying is basically of the three original trilogy actors you think Luke will have more of a spotlight in this one? Yeah, I think it's going to be Luke. I remember hearing something before the movies came out, and this was like all speculation, that it was going to be like episode 7 was going to be um, Han's movie, episode 8 was going to be Luke's, and episode 9 would be um, Leia's. And obviously after the unfortunate passing of Carrie, I'm not really sure what the plan is, but I mean, it's way too early to even think about worrying about something like that. But I think, uh, I hope that Luke and Leia have like a, 
big spotlight in the next movie while still not taking away from the characters. I hope they make the movie like three hours long. There's so much I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And All right, now, now, I think, well, Luke is, I think he's the obvious choice. And Yoda did call Luke the last of the Jedi you will be. So Thanks for the spoiler, Yoda. <laughs> so I, I think it's Luke. Thanks for spoiling the 40-year-old movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we didn't see this coming. <laughs> and he's going to, of course, pass the torch to, or lightsaber to Rey. And so maybe Rey will be the last of the Jedi. And she will be where Luke was at the end of Return of the Jedi, where she is now taking up the mantle of being a Jedi Master, having to train a new order. However, oh, you think she'll be a Jedi Master by the end of 8? Oh, no, 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 no. She's, gonna, she's going to be, that's going to be her journey. Getting oh, to that okay. place the same I was way. Say, oh, yeah. That's fast. <laughs> yeah. she's episode good, eight, but she's not that good, Richard. <laughs> episode eight takes takes place over fifty years. Okay. All right. Now, on the other side of that, of my belief, yes. I think we're referring to Kylo Ren. Ooh. Now, I I do think this is this is what what my strong belief is, is that Leia is going to search out Kylo Ren, and convince him to to come back to the light side of the force or come back to her and the family. And because of that, Snoke is all upset. This is his pupil. And we're going to get a big battle in episode nine, the same way we did for Return of the Jedi with Luke and Vader fighting with the Emperor right in the middle. So in this, this time, it's going to be Snoke right in the middle of Kylo and Luke. Huh. See, I'm not, really, uh, I'm not really sure that's something that I would... That I would want. Well, um, I imagine that's probably what they're going to go with at this point. I, I sort of like the idea of it, assuming that like Ray is a, a Skywalker and Kylo Ren isn't the last of the uh, Skywalker line. I would really like if, I mean, Kylo Ren sort of had his redemption moment with Han. He, he sort of looked into the face and then he stabbed it. <laughs> and I, I would like if I would like if Kylo just doesn't get redeemed at the end of the day and then assuming ray is like a skywalker you're able to continue the line that way but if but, leia were to redeem her son after what he had just done oh my oh my goodness i think that would be a, a fantastic resolve to leia's character yeah like if we're if we're talking leia's story stuff i think one thing that could happen and this is just like pure speculation just because we're talking about it is that I mean, the the lay character is going to have to be written off at some point, which is, I mean, it's awful to say. I don't know how they'll do it, but I imagine it will be in some way where Kylo Ren isn't directly involved, and maybe Kylo Ren hearing about his mother's death just sets him on edge. Maybe if, like, Snoke made an order or something that led to Leia dying, and then Kylo Ren sort of having doubts. I can totally see the Luke and Snoke fighting or like Ray and Snoke fighting and then Kylo Ren being in the middle and having to team up with one of them. I think that's completely realistic. And how how big is Snoke? And <laughs> I think Snoke is like seven is. feet tall. I think they said that. <laughs> Actually I, I have seen a clip of episode eight. He's six inches tall. See that makes oh, sense. Oh Snoke to is me. six inches tall. He's six okay. inches tall. Well, that's yes. a bit of a difference, Richard. <laughs> you know what? maybe I shouldn't have uh, said anything because I was showing that clip in confidence. Asterisk, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Richard, you're about to get sued. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. So wow. I, I think Luke is going to sacrifice himself the way Obi-Wan did in Star Wars. So mm. he will be the last Jedi. Now, let's not ignore the fact that Star Wars, the logo, is in red. Yes. There's so no getting around up. that. Okay. I'm colorblind. I can't tell. Oh. <laughs> like, honest to God, it looks the same, but oh. I know it's red. All right, oh. take it from us. The Star and the Wars is red the same way it was for Return of the Jedi. Right. That and the, Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, all, yes. all red, but in Return of the Jedi, it was red because Luke did, he did teeter Vacillate. to the dark side of the Force. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm thinking they're oh. going to do the whole ring circle thing, which I never really understood. And he and <laughs> Kylo will be teetering back, good side, light side, good side, light side, because the Last Jedi logo, the font, is in white, while the Star in the Wars, the Star Wars, is in red. Uh. I really hope. Uh, I really hope an eight and nine aren't just another like rehash of no five and six. Because I mean, not with Ryan Johnson at the helm. 
Yeah, I remember all that stuff about like ring theory and about how the cycle repeats itself. And the Force Awakens was was pretty much a carbon copy of A New Hope. Like when you break it down, story and beat wise, mm. I'm not really sure that I want another Empire Strikes Back and another clear cut Return of the Jedi. I'd like for them to shake it up somehow, which is why I think Kylo not getting redeemed would be like that's one really easy way to do that. Yeah, but it's I think it goes with the storytelling of the Star Wars of the oh, Star yeah, Wars yeah, mythos. Yeah. But from what I'm I'm hearing is that episode eight just puts Star Wars in a box and just shake the the Jesus <laughs> out of it. Wow. I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and and Ryan Johnson, he he doesn't play around. No, no. He has No, some I, of the I most think uh, Ryan, Ryan Johnson Ryan Johnson's probably like one of my favorite directors after his work on Looper and Breaking Bad and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I really think that this is gonna. I think this has the potential to blow the Force Awakens out of the water, and I love the Force Awakens. I All hope right. it blows it out of the water. I want every movie to blow every movie I've ever seen out of the water. I'm not sure <laughs> if it will do that though. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Well, I I had a note about the Last Jedi, the title, and mm-hmm. I wish I could take credit for this, but I saw it first from Michael Nip, who pointed out that it forms a complete sentence: "The Force Awakens, the Last Jedi." <laughs> So, oh, that was interesting. And and then people have gone further and put all three titles with a speculated title for episode nine up. And the full title would be The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi from His Nap. Mm. All right. You should have stopped while, while you were ahead. No, I just I just think that's funny. So if, if you take it in the sentence form, The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, then you'd think it's, it's probably just Luke. Referring to Luke. Okay. So I, I thought that was neat, though. That is that's very very neat. Now, now let's table that. <laughs> you know, I thought the I thought the Force Awakens like from his nap jokes would end after <laughs> after the Force uh, Awakens came out, and they nope. just yeah they, we were they all just hoping. made it worse. Ryan Johnson liked the memes too much. He didn't want it to go away. <laughs> oh, <Yes>. <laughs> that's funny. Now let me ask you this: Why do you think Disney decided to release the title on such a random Ugh. Monday? And why not wait until Super Bowl Sunday or Star Wars Celebration Orlando? And why, why now when it's going to take away from Rebels that everyone was just talking about, now they're talking about The Last Jedi? Are you, uh, are you ready for a conspiracy theory? Sure. Yeah, lay it on me. I was reading stuff about how when The Force Awakens title was announced, two weeks later uh, the first teaser came out. Oh. And two weeks from now is the Super Bowl. And Rebels is on hiatus for like two or three weeks. Yeah. So maybe they're using this period to build hype and then unveil a teaser at a, during the Super Bowl. Because I know they revealed like a trailer or something during Monday Night Football in August. So obviously right. they're not October. against airing stuff during the NFL games. And airing something during the Super Bowl would make sense. I think it's probably going to be like teaser during Super Bowl and then first full trailer at Celebration. Right, but what, huh. then why not just release the trailer, the, the title, during the Super Bowl with a small teaser? Because, sweetie, that would be way too much for Star Wars fans <laughs> to grasp. Like, their minds no, would they, explode. They would, they would just be blown away, Richard. Yes. You, you, there would be, like, four deaths on your hand if you were in charge of that. <laughs> just, from the, just from the aneurysms that people would have. Just like, The Last Jedi, uh, Mark Hamill's in it. Yeah. And then yeah. they'll just, like, all flip out. I mean, <laughs> I that's did. what they did for The Force Awakens, and that worked out fine. When you saw the title and then... Yeah, I think it was Thanksgiving yeah. or the day after that they it was released the, the teaser. The yeah, the yes. first it was the first week of November in 2014 that they released the title. Yes, and then it was the last week of November on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, they released the teaser trailer. Right. So they did mm-hmm. it separately, but I think this time around they should do it all in one. Right. Yeah, I I did. Oh, tweet. It's too late, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. I did. I Call did, the Flash. No. That's my first time. <laughs> I did tweet at Star Wars the day the this uh, the Last Jedi was released. I was like, "How does it feel to like have just be able to drop this bomb on the internet and completely <laughs> just make all Star Wars fans stop doing work of any kind?" <laughs> yeah, but we're all talking about Rebels at that point. Everyone was really I excited. Know. So why rain on your own? Why why step on your your own hype and your own excitement? Yeah. Why not build off of it? I, I do Dude, like it was Tyler's like the day, theory. or it was like the day or the day after that they showed the uh, the cover for that mall comic number three that had Cad Bane on the front of it. There, there's too much awesome Star Wars stuff. They got to trample over some stuff at some point. Uh. <laughs> yeah, well, how about maybe next week? <laughs> no, nah, <laughs> that would make too much sense, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, I'm sure at some point 
we're going to find the answers, just not anytime soon. It's true. So did you happen to see the video by Josh Gad as he was trying to get the answer out of Daisy Ridley? Oh, the uh, the one where he like called her <laughs> into his trailer and just yes. interrogated her about The Last Jedi? Yeah, but he prefaced yeah. it another way and then just slipped it in, hoping she would accidentally reveal the answer. But you know what? <laughs> he didn't really he didn't really slip it in. He's just like, who are The Last Jedi? And he's like, okay, well, I, you can't tell me. I get it. But who are The Last Jedi? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? And Daisy Ridley said something about, like, can you tell me secrets from Frozen 2? And you learned <laughs> Olaf know. was in it, so congratulations. You got a scoop, I guess. <laughs> you know what? You can either hear us talk about it, or we could play that clip right now because the tone in her voice—it's—it's. It's, you know what? It's like you're put, you're putting the voice in a box and shaking the bejesus out of it. Jeez, <laughs> Richard. So let's go ahead and roll that clip right now. Hey. 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 You want to ask me something? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm so glad you could come over. Come over. So, uh, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm I'm doing well. I um. You look great, by the way. Thank you. This, serve, this really suits you. Thank you. I had an important question to ask you, and I'm mm-hmm. so sorry. I just, I meant to call you last night, and mm-hmm. it's about today's scene. Yeah. Um, who are the last Jedi? We're not doing this, Josh. No, 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 no. Like, because is it one, or is it more than one? Because I need it in order to figure out what we're doing on the train today. I, I can't ask you about first so is two. is plural? I'll tell you that... Olaf is in Frozen too. Is it more than one Jedi? Is it ominous? Josh? It sounds ominous. Does something happen to you and Mark? Or just Mark? Are you a Jedi? Answer my damn question, Daisy. Josh? I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to raise my voice. This is not what I need to start my day. Okay. I can't tell you. So I'm going to leave and we'll reconvene when you're kind of done. Okay. Okay. Can we just... Can we do it tonight? Can we talk? Can we finish it? Um, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> All right, Tyler, do you think Daisy was more annoyed or was she was she playing along? I know being on a movie set, I, I'm sure it was like 5 a.m. and she was not in the right <laughs> headspace for that. Uh, what, what did you get out of Daisy's I, I, attitude? Richard, Richard, I think she was very close to leaking the entire plot of episode eight. Josh Gatt almost <laughs> had her. He almost had her, Richard. <laughs> If you just kept uh, this iPhone running for another another two and a half hours, we would have gotten it. That's the secret <laughs> to getting people to spill details about Star Wars. You just ask them when they're tired. <laughs> and it works. Yeah. And yeah. in the bathroom and at 5 a.m. Honestly, yeah. Yeah, my at 5 a.m. in the bathroom. A... That's the perfect. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, my favorite part as a girl about that video was just seeing how they're in the hair and makeup before, you know, on the movie set. She's in her, you know, she's obviously going to be putting on a wig and yeah. all that stuff. And they're, they were shooting <laughs> Murder on the Orient Express, which is, yes. they're doing a remake of. Nice. Nice. Is that what they're now, shooting? Yeah. Yeah, oh that'll be coming out later on this year. Yeah. I didn't even realize that. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right That'll on. It'll be fun. All right, now... Tyler, with that, let's wrap it up by telling everyone where they can get a hold of you on social media and what you're working on next. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at T Westhouse, at T W E S T H A U S E. Uh, you can join the Star Wars Podcast Alliance Facebook group. That's the Facebook group for the Star Wars Podcast Alliance, which the site is now up. You can find that at Star Wars Podcast Alliance.com. You can go to the Facebook group just to talk about general Star Wars stuff. You can plug your own show if you got one. It's really just about promoting unity in the community and getting the fandom to discuss stuff. We had a really big thread about the uh, last Jedi title with a lot of, <laughs> with a lot of funny speculation. The other thing that I can tease and give some details on, but we're going to have more details coming out later on. And this is something that I've let Richard and Sarah know about is uh, I'm heavily involved in the planning of a Carrie Fisher Memorial event at first star Wars celebration called uh, drowning in moonlight. The name comes from a quote from Carrie Fisher's book, Wishful Drinking. It's a, uh, it's a memorial event. It, all the proceeds are going to charity. It's going to be at the Rosen Center, right next to the uh, Orlando Convention Center, uh, 7.30 to 10.30 p.m. that Thursday after the first day of celebration. So after we hopefully get a trailer for Episode 8, you can go hang out with a bunch of really cool Star Wars fans. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of giveaways. We're going to be doing a lot of... Uh, raffles at the door. Uh, we're going to have a really big marquee event, which is going to be a huge, huge, huge uh, Star Wars podcasters, like all-star dinner. We're going to have people prominent in the Star Wars podcast community. We're going to have people who have been on Star Wars podcasts that you're a fan of, wink, wink. 
Um, <laughs> it's going to be uh, it's going to be really really gigantic. I think it's going to if there's a record for the most people to appear on a Star Wars podcast at once. And I know Skywalking, you guys have had a lot of people on at once. I've heard of the episodes. <laughs> um, I think this, this is going to blow it out of the water. We're looking at a gigantic amount of people, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the event's going to be 16 plus, but if you are under 16 and you're interested in going, you can easily just uh, tweet at me, and I will make an exception for you. It's just a, a tentative thing. Uh, you can follow the Drowning in Moonlight event on Twitter. It's at Carrie Gala. Uh, you can also go to drowninginmoonlight.com. That website should be up in a few days. And then you can go to uh, drowninginmoonlight.eventbrite.com and then buy tickets. And tickets are only 40 bucks. It's all going to charity to help us with the space. The, like I said, it's going to charity. It's going to be Carrie Fisher themed drinks. It's going to be Carrie Fisher themed food. It's going to be a, it's going to be a really like fun event to uh, celebrate the life and honor Carrie Fisher. And I wanted to make sure that's something that we did given that um, she had fortunately passed, but I think it's going to be a really great way to honor her. And I'd love to see it. The sky, skywalking community there. Cause I've said it before on many shows. I've never seen a community as positive as the Skywalking community, and uh, to be honest, it frightens me, but I appreciate it. (laughs) Well, thank you, Tyler, and thanks for everything that you're doing for the whole fandom community itself and for Carrie Fisher. We can't wait to have you back on to give us complete details. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me on again. I really, really appreciate it. It's always a blast to be on with you guys. Now, everyone had something to say about the Last Jedi title. I contributed to an article on RetroZap.com with a lot of other RetroZap writers, and Mark Hamill himself even weighed in on this clip from the Associated Press. Star Wars The Last Jedi it was just announced. I just heard it on the, in the car ride over. He told me that when we were making the movie, and I said, don't tell me these things. I talk in my sleep. I am so, they have us so jacked up with paranoia over leaks. Right. But that's the way of the world. It's funny because, you know, back when we were making the original, nobody cared. <laughs> but uh, that's... What's now. your reaction to the title? Well, it's got a, it's got a real samurai. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's straightforward and minimalist, and I like that. Now, he didn't say too much, did he? That's because he couldn't. Yeah. Say, oh, he knows exactly why it's called The Last Jedi. Yeah, pretty much. But I liked how he answered the question he wanted to be asked <laughs> and commented that it did sound like a samurai title. So he did the Zootopia thing <laughs> where you're asked a question, you answer that question with a question, and then answer that question. <laughs> and that's precisely what he did. Very, 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 very smart man. <laughs> nice. Now, the poster for The Last Jedi, the teaser poster, was also released. And this was basically the Star Wars title and the red font separated by The Last Jedi title Mm -hmm. with the Starfield. Very similar to The Force Awakens. Yes. So hopefully within the – hopefully at Celebration, they're going to give us those mini posters of the actual (gasps) – the actual tease – Teaser of the teaser. Right. So that's the teaser. Then they have a, then they need another teaser. A teaser poster for the teaser poster? Yes. Yes. Like the Drew Struzan poster we got. Yeah. yeah was, Is that, that correct? Like, yeah. A very in-house teaser poster. Okay. Nice. So can't wait to get that. All right. Now, let's talk a little Her Universe. What do you think? Should we? Oh, I'm Should so we? excited about this. Oh, yeah. So we are recording this right after I just got finished watching Ashley Eckstein on Facebook Live talking about Her Universe because Her Universe is back. And also, uh, yeah, I'm so excited. So her website you know, her universe was acquired by Hot Topic. So her website was offline for quite a few months. So now it is back as of January 24th. It is back online and Fangirl of the Day is back. So you can nominate yourself or another favorite fangirl you love right on the Her Universe website. Do you know who will not be nominated or chosen? Me. You? Me. Doesn't matter because I'm a boy. You are a boy. I don't get chosen for Skywalker of the Week or Rebel Spy, so why would I be chosen for that? Because you're a boy. <laughs> That's irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my commentary. Okay, well, well, but I'm excited 
because her universe is back. Okay, so on her Facebook Live, she just mentioned a few things that I wanted to tell you guys. So here we go. Men's fashion. This is something you can be excited about. Her universe is going to do men's fashion that will be available for the holiday 2017 season. Are you excited? I am very, very excited. And when we talked to Ashley uh, a few months ago, was it? Mm -hmm. And I brought that up. I I given her some ideas, which she's like, hmm, hmm. Yeah. So hopefully, I'm not going to say anything right now, but hopefully those will be implemented because I would love that. Yeah, she did say that they're working on some jackets as well as tees. So hopefully there will be something really cool coming down the line. But as for men's fashion, there will be something available for Star Wars Celebration Orlando this year for men and women, and it is another Dave Filoni Ahsoka Design t-shirt. Oh, nice. So that'll be available. Joey Pittman just said he wants a Dave Filoni cowboy hat. Ah, nice. <laughs> yeah, I saw you. I saw you on that message. Hopefully her you know, hopefully she'll be reading that, those comments <laughs> on her Facebook Live. I love that. That's so cute. So that is one thing that we can all look forward to at Star Wars Celebration Orlando. Also, she's designing an Ahsoka collection. So not Ooh. just an Ahsoka t-shirt or an Ahsoka like hoodie, but a full-on Ahsoka collection. So I'm excited about that. Now, did she say that's going to be for guys and girls or just the girls? For Probably the Ahsoka this collection? is just girls because she said it's going to be out um, this year no. before okay, gotcha. holiday. Gotcha. Yeah. And since the, the men's collection titled Our Universe yeah. won't be out until November. Right. Yeah, that's right. He's not going to be his universe. It's not going to be under the label Her Universe. It will be... Our, Our universe. universe. Hey, uh, Scope Walkers and Facebook Watchers, do we, do we like the fact that we are our universe and not his universe? How do we feel about that? Hmm. Oh, no. I'd like to maybe have a wing that was called his universe. His universe, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Huh. Why, why do the girls get everything? I don't know. But Patty Hammond just reminded me on Facebook that also coming very soon in the next couple days is a Leia T for charity. So if you buy this t-shirt on the Her Universe website, many of your proceeds will go to charity and they are working that out right now. So that's exciting. And also another fun thing is if you get an awesome Her Universe item in the mail and you take a picture of yourself with it and you show it off, well, you can Instagram that or tweet that with the hashtag flaunt your world and you may see yourself on the Her Universe website. It's like an automatic auto post. It grabs your photo and puts it right on the front page of her website. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was so heartfelt when she was remembering that panel she was on with Carrie Fisher. Mm -hmm. Ashley Eckstein was. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see that Facebook video. It's, it's no longer just live. So you can actually go to... Her universe on Facebook and check that out. So, what's the one thing, Sarah, that you that really stuck out to you that you cannot wait to get? Oh goodness. Okay, <laughs> that's a really hard question. I, I actually one thing I'm excited to get is, is a picture that I saw of her that she was showing herself with a Ray hoodie. And it has like cutouts in the in the sleeves and uh -huh. things. It's not something she showed on her Facebook Live, but it's really neat. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to share about that video that was just aired and I think is still airing? <laughs> well, I no, nothing else right now because otherwise this will turn into a whole Her Universe program. But <laughs> so right now, that's all I want to share. But head over to Her Universe and check it out. Do you like the fact that she, that Her Universe has been sold to Hot Topic? Uh, honestly, it's... As it is, it's it's acquired by them, and it's actually helped her universe. So they're going to be able to ship internationally. They're going to have a, a blanket shipping, like a $4.99 uh, oh. shipping rate. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I like the fact that it's like Disney buying Lucasfilm, that mm -hmm. instead of being a small company, now it's huge and can really expand. Right. So big things to come. Now, talking about big things to come, let's talk about these Oscars. Okay. And our gripes. <laughs> Yeah, I was reading down the Oscar nomination list this morning, and we're looking, and we're looking, okay, and we're looking. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And There's the best picture, blah, 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 blah. Seen it, haven't heard of it, haven't heard of it, haven't heard of it. What is that? Yeah. And, and no Rogue One. 
So maybe I spoke too soon when I said big things to come because not a lot of big things to come. No. With the with the uh, this coming Oscars and <sighs> come on. Okay, so Rogue One. Let's just get to it. Yes. It's got two. What? Two? Yes. Two. Two nominations for best sound mixing. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's up against Arrival, Hacksaw Ridge, La La Land, and 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. Huh. Who? <laughs> Ex- exactly. <laughs> uh, so why not uh, best sound or best sound effects editing? Yeah. Why did it get shut out of that? All right. But for me, this next category, best visual effects, I think by far will be the the most nail-biting category for me. Right. Not even above the best picture because I, I, I don't really know who to vote for because... What? what? Well... I am voting for Rogue One, okay, but Doctor Strange is in there, which had some amazing effects, and Jungle Book is in there, too, which made a whole world out of downtown LA, so I'm just, oh my gosh, between those three, I'll be really upset if Deepwater Horizon or Kubo and the Two Strings win, but, but... Beyond, those three are, like, high up there for me. Also in the best visual effects category is Kubo and the Two Strings, which everyone raves about, which I still haven't seen. Yes. And Deep Water Horizon. Right. So I think it can be pared down to Rogue One, which really progressed visual effects. Now, Doctor Strange had fantastic effects. We saw a lot of similar effects in Guardians of the Galaxy, they they were the the cape alone should be worthy of its mm. own Oscar. Right, Jungle Book created environments, but so did the prequels, the okay. Star Wars prequels. However, uh, in Rogue One, they they created a performance from a known actor. Right, and that's what Darth <sighs> Tuba says on Periscope as well. He's with you. He said that they created a Tarkin. Enough said. Y- yeah, there there you have it. So. Come on, Academy, you've let us down for 40-some-odd years. <laughs> oh, by the way, remember when we finished reading the nominations, what did we say? Hashtag no Star Wars or... Um... Hashtag seriously? <laughs> Hashtag again? Oh, <laughs> hashtag um, no, no, no... No surprises? So no, no geek... <laughs> No, no geek, geek love, <laughs> but you know what? 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 What do we expect? It's it's the Oscars, and it's I, true. I've got friends who are who are as part of the voting academy. They, they give it to their kids to vote or their, their neighbors, and it's whatever studio hands over the biggest gift baskets. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, okay, I want to vote for this because you just gave me an iWatch and an iPhone and a, <laughs> a car. So of course I'm going to vote for you. So. Right. Eh. Oh, and Joey Pittman says no Giacchino. That's right. Yeah. He so, wasn't nominated so what? Why was it not nominated for best original score, costumes, mm-hmm. sound effects, editing, editing itself? Right. It, I think editing itself. My goodness. Oh yeah. Those those the the beginning scene uh with with the Urso family and Jen running down to her little hideout. The way that was edited was just was fantastic and uh kevin raider nerd just pointed out makeup Mm -hmm. come on and you know what i'm just gonna say it best picture come on (laughs) come on that was an amazing (sighs) movie but let's uh give let's uh, let's give a huge huge shout out to our good friend natalie portman that's right because she's our friend because she was in a star wars movie in fact, we've got an upcoming Star Wars story where our friend Dave Scale, the ghost host and Rebel Spy, he had a, 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 an encounter with Natalie Portman and yeah. got an awesome selfie with Natalie Portman. <laughs> That's why I'm calling Natalie Portman our friend. <laughs> so she was nominated for Best Actress in a Leading Role. Yes, for Jackie. That's and, right. And she did an amazing job. She did. And I am also happy to report that Disney got some nominations. So for Best Original Song, Moana was nominated for How Far I'll Go. I know everybody on this island has a role on this island. So maybe I can roll with mine. Which is an amazing song and it really is a rousing song (laughs) and also for best animated short piper which played before finding Finding dory Dory. and if oh my goodness piper is like the cutest thing you have ever seen in your life (laughs) and 
yeah, I think it needs to win. Yeah. That's amazing. But then for best animated feature, this was an interesting one because we had Moana, we had Zootopia, Woo-hoo! but we did not have Finding Dory. Just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Uh, honestly, I'm not surprised about that. But being the the big, f- huge money maker that it was. Oh, that's true. But we always know. Uh, come on, Rogue One over a billion dollars and yeah. only nominated twice. So yeah, but are we surprised? I thought Finding Dory would have gotten it over Moana. I thought Moana was a much better film. Hmm. So I I just thought that was interesting. However, they can't have <laughs> f- uh, five nominees and three be Disney. They could. <laughs> well, yeah, I hope they would. La La Land just, is pretty much sweeping yeah, like the yeah, just, original song category. So. All right. Now, before we wrap this up, Sarah and everyone else, who do we want to win this best animated feature out of Moana or Zootopia? <laughs> it's a Team Hoojip thing. I got to go with Zootopia. Yeah, me too. Me plus, too. Plus, it's a movie I like put on all the time just <laughs> yeah. as, a, as and, a fun, and, you know, to do while I'm... Everyone on... Uh, all of our scope walkers are all saying Zootopia. No, oh. Oh, there's a there's oh, some Moana. Moana's in there. Says Moana. How about the Facebook watchers? Yeah. Uh, Alan Hufana Kubo. says Finding Dory did not deserve a nomination. Uh, oh, Alan he's also going... says Kubo. Okay. Kubo and the two strings. I, we need to see that. I think. Yeah, I. But you know what? I love Moana. Yeah. I did, but yeah. Zootopia. A, you have a, a bunny uh, and a fox. Right. Come on. I yeah. Come on. And it's a it's a buddy cop story, like a, a, and a, a caper. Like, so amazing. Okay. Very true. Very true. All right. But one more thing I want to point out. Eric Warren just said we need another all-time awards again like we did last year. Oh. Well, I'm very happy to say that will be coming in the near future. Will it? Yes, it will. Okay. I'm making that announcement right now, even to you. <laughs> All right. We had a lot of things to share this week. So let's go ahead and wrap up things, things we, we want, want to share. share and get on to our big segment of the episode where we talk about the Dark Saber with our good friend Jocasta Drew. When the Dark Saber was first created on Clone Wars, for a long time the character Pre Vizsla that first wields the Dark Saber in the show, he had what was called in Star Wars a vibro blade, which is not a lightsaber. When George saw that, he kind of said, "Yeah, I've, I've heard of those things, but there's no way it could stop a lightsaber." And that's where George created the Dark Saber. Legend tells that it was created over a thousand years ago by Tar Vizsla, the first Mandalorian ever inducted into the Jedi Order. After his passing. The Jedi kept the Saber in their temple. That was until members of House Vizsla snuck in and liberated it. They used the Saber to unify the people and strike down those who would oppose them. One time, they ruled all of Mandalore wielding this blade. Last week's episode of Star Wars Rebels, Trials of the Dark Saber, is being hailed as the best yet. Sabine is asked to step up and face her past by taking up the Dark Saber, the weapon that was once used to rule all of Mandalore. This wasn't the first we've seen of the Darksaber since it first appeared in episodes of Star Wars The Clone Wars. Let's now track the history of this saber and try to figure out its future. So here with us to help us is Skywalking Through Neverland book reviewer and the Star Wars Maven blog site, Jocasta Drew. And son! Hey, hey, Drew. Hey, Richard and Sarah. And yes, I've got my son, Eli. Hopefully he doesn't (laughs) wreck your house. (laughs) Hey, Eli, get out of the fireplace. (laughs) <laughs> Eli? All right, good. Now, let's talk, other than child safety, let's talk about the Dark Saber. Yeah. Now, we saw this in Star Wars The Clone Wars. What episode did we see it, and how was it used? We've seen it in a bunch of episodes. The first one we see it is in the Mandalore plot, where Pre Vizsla wields it against Obi-Wan Kenobi, and he also gives a little bit of an intro as to what it is, as well as fighting Obi-Wan Kenobi with it. And he, he wields it for a bit until it's taken over eventually by Darth Maul in their really awesome epic battle in Mandalore. And, um, and we see Maul even wielding it, A, against Duchess Satine, where she loses her head, but also against uh, Darth Sidious after, uh, after his brother Savage Press is killed. So that's, that's it. And then once Sidious takes him into custody... It's just left on Mandalore. So that's the last time we see it on screen before we come back to Star Wars Rebels. Now, for people who haven't 
uh, read or seen anything beyond the screen, what happens in Darth Maul, Son of Dathomir, is that Prime Minister Almec finds the Darth Saber. He said, hey, by the way, or Dark Saber, we've, we found this back on Mandalore, uh, and here we are giving it back to you. And, and they're, they're acknowledging his leadership, his power with that, that it really belongs to him because he defeated Pre Vistal in a duel. Who are they giving it back to? To Darth, Darth Maul. Maul. So at the beginning of Darth Maul, Son of Dathomir, after Death Watch, get him, break him loose from Darth Sidious's holding him in a, in a jail or a prison. So they, Prime Minister Almec hands back the, Darth, the, uh, the dark saber to him and says, hey, hey, here, this belongs to you. And throughout the rest of that Darth Maul Son of Dathomir comic, we see him wielding it, and um, and he takes it with him. And that's yeah. really the last time we see it until the episode where we we're back on, we're back on Dathomir, and it and he's telling Ezra, "Hey, there's these are a bunch of artifacts that I have from my past." You know what? Let me, uh, let me let me interject here. Yeah. All Mac, if I, is he a Mandalorian? Yeah. So Almec was initially, he was prime minister sort of the first time we see him. Okay, yes. And then eventually he's thrown into jail, but ultimately Darth Maul and Savage Press release him from prison. Eventually they killed Duchess Satine, and then Maul puts Almec in as sort of the figurehead right. in charge of Mandalore. Okay. Yeah. Right. Now he would give Darth Maul the dark saber, even though he's not Mandalorian. Right, because he rightfully won it in a duel against Pre Vizsla, who had been wielding the Darksaber. I claim this sword, and my rightful place as leader of Death Watch. Okay, so it's, yeah. That, so it's, it's not a prerequisite, you got to be a Mandalorian, it's whoever, right. whoever's the most powerful in, in a duel, or if you're holding the Darksaber and get, and get struck down, the one mm-hmm. who strikes you down, like Darth Maul... Right. Is the rightful owner right? They okay. respect that, and I and that's probably some sort of Mandalorian code of honor where you rightfully win it; it's yours. Mm-hmm. And that's, I and maybe they didn't count on someone who's non Mandalorian actually winning. Right? <laughs> oh yeah, so, all bets were on on Pre Vizsla. Right, and he had a lot of gear. You know, he was able to shoot. He had rockets, so he had a lot of advantages. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now the Son of Dathomir comic, we see that. Maul has the lightsaber, mm-hmm. the dark saber, excuse me. Yeah. And then it's not till Star Wars Rebels, visions and voices that it yeah. reappears. Right. Okay. And one of the funny things about even just the nomenclature of it is that Pre Vistal refers to it as a lightsaber. And also in the beginning of um, the recent episode where um, where Kanan asks Fenral, I didn't know you guys developed, the Mandalorians developed the lightsaber. He's like, oh, well, we didn't. It was just Ta Vizsla who did it. And da, da, da. But it's funny because on the internet, most people refer to it as the Darksaber. And of course, now with Trials of the Darksaber, it pretty much encodes that that's actually how it's going to formally be referred to as the Darksaber. But it was really just the dark lightsaber, I guess, before. Okay. Right. And yeah. at the end of Son of Dathomir, the graphic yeah. novel, it was left on... Darth Maul still possesses it. Oh, okay. All right. And then at what point does it get left on Dathomir? So that uh, – oh. Am I jumping it, ahead? Uh, so he has it. I mean, that's his sort of little shrine, I guess. Darth Maul has it. So Dathomir he, is kind of a place he goes back to. Right. So it just kind of makes sense it would end up right, there. The it's kind of like your Star Wars room, Richard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, the only time we ever see Dathomir ever again after Star Wars The Clone Wars is in Dark Disciple. And we see um, we see Asajj Ventress taking um, Voss. Um, Va- we see we see her taking Voss there, but no one else really goes to Dathomir. I mean, it used to be all these night witches or whatever the night sisters, mm-hmm. who and they still seem like in Voices and Visions, like they still maintain a presence even if they're not no longer bodily living, right. which is fascinating. And so. Um, and then in Voices and Visions, we see Maul. It's really unclear why he doesn't really care to use it. Right, it's there, and we see him in Trials of the of the Apprentice. Why isn't he wielding Twilight it? Twilight of the Apprentice. Twilight. Right? I'm sorry, Twilight of the That's Apprentice, okay. which is um, my favorite Rebels episode. Yes, we see we see him not using it, mm-hmm. and then here again, it's there. He has it, but he doesn't. Not only does he not care to wield it, he's okay just leaving. Right, he just hops in a ship and he just leaves. Um, and then so when. Uh, first, Sabine uses it when she's sort of spirited. She's enchanted. She wheels it against Ezra, and then she drops it. But then Ezra uses it to break the smash the altar with his lightsaber. He does has that in one hand, his regular lightsaber in the other, and he smashes it. Um, and then he just drops it, right? Hmm. And then Sabine picks it up. When we see at the end of Voices and Visions, Sabine picking it up, she looks at it curiously, but it's yes. not clear that she knows 
what it is when she picks it up and takes it with her. Right. And um, it's almost as an afterthought that she does pick it up, right? Right. It's just an just an after not, afterthought. But then at the beginning of of Trials of the Dark Saber, we see that Kanan said, "Oh, she seems to know what it is, but she just left it with me." Mm. And so she does eventually figure it out between the end of Voices and Visions and the beginning of Trials of the Dark Saber that she has a sense of what it is, but is not so comfortable holding it, possessing it. Right. Now, at what when I was doing research on this, I, I read that Sabine was, and I know we've seen this somewhere, mm-hmm. she was possessed when she was first using the Dark Saber. Yeah. Who was possessing her, and what, how does that fit in? She's possessed by the Night Sister, the witches or, of Dathomir. Yeah, right. Um, or some some element of their spirits that was possessing both her and Kanan against uh, Ezra and Maul. Right. And what episode did we see that? That Vi- was the end of the first half of the third season. So Ever. visions and voices, right? All right. So knowing that, we now pick up the Dark Saber in Trials of the Dark Saber, the last episode of Star Wars Rebels. Yes. All right, so take us from there, from that moment when, when Kanan gives it, shows it to Fen. Yeah, so Fen Rao knows what it is. He's, first of all, shocked. He's like, you have it? And then he's like, yeah, I know what that is. And mm-hmm. so he gives us a really fascinating origin story that Tar Vizsla, a Mandal- the first ever Mandalorian Jedi, created it. But after his death, it remained in the, te- the Jedi Temple, at least until those of House Vizsla were able to uh, reclaim it, it, to liberate it. Yes, yeah. until they were able to liberate it. <laughs> and then uh, it's it stayed in House Vizsla's hands, and eventually enabling them to unite all of Mandalore, or unite all the houses. And so it was a symbol of power. It was probably more than just a symbol. There was probably a lot of... Whoever wielded it probably had a significant degree of power, as we see even with pre Vizsla. And then eventually it becomes into Darth Maul's hands. Now, the question I have, um, which I'm really curious about, is why does Darth Maul not care about it anymore? Well, I think, and you postulate this in your article on Star Wars Maven.info, and that is yeah. that maybe it doesn't respond to him as well. Like, kind of lightsabers are, uh, you know, the the crystal inside is attuned well, even, to the wielder. Right, and even when Sabine had the dark saber when she was... She's starting to understand how it works and its significance, Ooh, it became lighter it became and lighter. lighter for her. Right. Yeah. And that's what Kanan says to her. Now you're getting a sense of it. That's one part of it. That's, there's some sort of innate sense of what it is physically. But I am also curious, maybe the Mandalorians, especially Death Watch, were very unimpressed with Maul at the end of, at the end of uh, Darth Maul, Son of Death, because he got a lot of them killed. Right. right. And so after he got a lot of them killed, maybe they said, you know what? You may have the Darksaber. And we recognize and we we acknowledge your power, but we don't recognize your power over us. You don't you don't maintain leadership. And I think I, I'm that's that's a story that's waiting to be told at another time. But that's just a possibility of why he. I mean, he even acknowledges when he's in, in Voice and Visions when he's on Dathomir. He says like these are all artifacts of when I used to have more power. So. Um, Continuing on from from maybe is it how much do they recognize it? I think that's a perfect lead in. Um, and Richard pointed me to the mid season three, um, the trailer for the the second half of the season three, which is really fascinating to see what happens now with Sabine. A at the end of Trials of the Dark Saber, having her emotional breakthrough and, and revealing at least to to her close cadre of rebels of like what's been going on with her and her family and the rest of Mandalore. And then also right. how much um, – what's going to happen in the future episodes? Like clearly she's battling on Mandalore. She comes back with Ezra. She's going to try to reclaim uh, some sort of uh, power. I'm really excited for all the battling. A, also see the fighting of the Darksaber, but really to see the development of Sabine. Right, and how – if she's going to take power, how how powerful she'll become – yeah. And leading a bunch of people because, but in the past, she's been just a part of this group of rebels and she hasn't been the leader at all. I'm very intrigued to see where I, that's going to take it. Right. Where and, that's going to take her. Right now, it's been Hera and Kanan, which also, just as a little flashback to Trials of the Dark Saber, oh. I love their interactions as the sort of quote unquote parents. Look, Sabine is a capable warrior, in some ways more so than Ezra, but she can't or. or won't find balance within herself. Until she does, wielding an actual lightsaber is far too dangerous for her. By letting her pretend with that stick, you're only encouraging her not to commit to this. You're not listening to me. If I let her use the darksaber, she will get hurt. She's already hurt. 
Her family hurt her more than any sword could. You don't see it because she doesn't want you to. But you can? Because I know what it's like when people you love don't believe in you. It's through that that they really are able to make the breakthroughs, I think, which is really great. So now that Sabine is committed to the Darksaber and going back to the Mandalorians and trying to bring them to the Rebellion, where do you think this is – how do you think that's going to happen from here? Not easily. It's a lot of speculation. It's it's a lot of speculation. I don't think it's going to happen easily. Um, Mandalorians are tough, right? We see even that in the last episode where Kanan's trying to express his frustrations at Hera like about Sabine, and she's like, she's Mandalorian. Um, and they're going to be really tough. I don't even know if she's able, a- even able to win them over, uh, which is the first step. But even if th- she is able to win them over, will they follow her in battle in the rebellion? Right. So now at this point, are the Mandalorians more pacifists? Are they going back to their warrior ways? What, Eli, what do you think? You got some opinions. <laughs> I'm curious. I, we don't really know what happens after the Clone Wars as far as what happens with the Mandalorians. We know there's a Siege of Mandalore, but we don't know, A, a whole bunch about the Siege of Mandalore itself, and then also we don't know what happens afterwards. We get a sense that there are the protectors, right? We saw the Concord Dawn. We, they're the protectors. Um, we also see that they call her out as being a traitor, Mm, right? right, And she said, oh, no, 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 no. My mother was Death Watch, but I'm not. So Sabine is already saying that she's different. But we also get a sense that there's Death Watch, there's the Protectors, there's a bunch of other groups. And we also see in the episode Imperial Super Commandos that there are groups willing to work with the Empire. And it, it's, it's complicated. Right. So you can't really say that it's a, it's a blanket situation where they're all pacifists or all warriors. They're just... They've divided over the years, so some are going to be the pacifists, like Satine, and some are going to be more of the warriors. Some will be more on the side of the Empire, so they are, right. just like any other culture, very split. Well, we see even in Star Wars Rebels that even the ones who are ha- having more embraced their warrior culture with the Mandalorian armor, that they even themselves are split. Some work for the – not necessarily for the Rebellion, but – work for the Empire or at least yeah, getting paid true. off by the Empire. So there's a variety, even just there. I don't even know what's going on on Mandalore itself. Right. So now the whole story behind Sabine and her family is that she left because she wasn't crazy about the fact they were making weapons for the Empire and right. she wanted out. And the her family and the everyone else on Mandalore saw her as a traitor because she didn't want to make weapons for the Empire that was just in turn turning around and using it to destroy planets, and which at some point will also include Mandalore. Right. And one of the fascinating things, so that explains why, why she's sort of on the run from the Empire and her family and sort of Mandalore writ large. But I'm also curious, like, when it says that she was involved in making those weapons, we already know that she's good with weapons and explosives in particular. So maybe I'm really curious to know, you know, going forward – what those were, were they of an explosive nature? And also, does she know how to sort of destruct them? Like, does she know sort of the workarounds to... Oh, you mean to stop the weapons yeah. from... Yeah, so she'll, she firing. possesses a special knowledge. If she was the one who was involved in creating those destructive weapons, can she also easily take them apart? So maybe you're, you're coming up with a plot for a future episode of Star Wars so, Rebels. Yes. <laughs> so she's, she's going to pull a Galen. She could, right. Yeah, she just does. like in Rogue One. Yeah. Nice. But she doesn't work for them anymore, so I guess we'll find out. Right. But no, she, she'll at least know the weak points. Right. That's yeah. true. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, so in this episode, uh, Trials of the Dark Saber, there was a point where Sabine went off on her own, and we saw the Bendu appear. Very briefly. But we did not yeah. see them meet. But Sabine was gone longer than normal. So do we think that Sabine and the Bendu talked? It's a it's clearly a possibility. It ha- if it were to have happened, it would be off screen. But with Bendu waking up with her simply being on top of him and then walking away, I think even if they didn't talk in this episode, it certainly sets up an opportunity for a future episode where they have a talk because right now we've only seen Bindu talking to other force wielders. We haven't seen him speaking with non force wielders like Sabine. So I think that obviously that's a foreshadowing of some sort of saying they are going to have a dialogue later on, which is going to be really interesting. Yeah. I think that's too big of a scene to cut 
not having the two talk because we all want to know what's going to happen when someone like Bendu talks to a non-force wielder like Sabine. Yeah. And he just looked at her and watched her go, which tells me that they're setting up something for a later episode. And maybe she, like Tar Vizsla, maybe she does possess a little bit of the force and is just beginning to awaken. Well, yeah. I think, I mean, I know you two are kind of on the same page with that, but I almost think that they talked... Uh, because she comes back clearer and calmer, but I think we're going to do kind of a flashback in a later episode that shows what actually happened in those moments. Well, just like anyone else, if you walk away from a tough situation long enough, you're going to come back more calm because you'll have more time for yourself and think about what just happened. I think the Bendu helped. I, don't think that, <laughs> I think that's way too big of a scene to cut her talking to Bendu. So I think that's that's foreshadowing, and as we know that these are not just standalone episodes, but they are connected. So that gives reason enough for an episode later on for the two of them to speak, or maybe Kanan and Bendu speak, and Kanan catches oh. her up, and then he, Bendu may say, you know what, there was something about her woke me up, because not mm. anything can wake up Bendu, and that in her, a little bit of midichlorians were like, hey, Bendu, we're here. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> I didn't know you used the M word on the show. Midichlorian? Yeah. Why not? We're all about prequel love. <laughs> I That's love right. it too. I and don't know that anybody's not, mentioned it beyond Phantom Menace. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I think why he woke up, and it's going to come through maybe Bendu, Ezra, and Kanan. Uh huh. Okay. It's interesting. You mentioned a sensitivity to whatever she possesses. It could also, I mean, more simply be that she sat on him or, you know. <laughs> see how and big he's like, he well, is? Ki- a bantha could sit on him and he wouldn't know. <laughs> I was also impressed by how quietly he moved, that she did not notice that there was this huge creature behind her moving. Yeah. Maybe it's his midichlorian. It's all going, shh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now the Darksaber, we got its origin story here yeah. in this episode, which I found amazingly interesting, and it totally reminded me of other myths and stories. So should we kind of throw those out there? Sure. Yeah. Who would like Let's to- do it. Okay. So, well, first of all, let me start by saying that Henry Gilroy, who is the co-executive producer, said that... This was an opportunity for us to kind of widen the mythology of the Darksaber and kind of give an idea of how it was connected to the Jedi. And in this particular case, the ruling parties of the House Vizsla had used the sword for many generations to keep power. So there's a sense that people would follow a sword if they believed in who was wielding it. What does that make you think of? Other famous swords? King Arthur? Yes, yeah. exactly. Like, to me, that totally gave me vibes of King Arthur and Camelot, you know, right after he pulled the sword from the stone as a young man. I know a lot of us listening to this show have seen Sword in the Stone. Oh. So, you know, he's a, he's a pretty young boy, but everyone bows down to him immediately after he wields the sword. He doesn't even have to prove that he's good with it. He just can take it from the stone. Mm, So I thought that was really cool. And I I love the mythological tones of this episode. And King Arthur's sword reminds me of uh, Thor in in Avengers 2, where we have no one can pick up Thor's hammer except for Vision. Who right. does it or without almost. a sweat? Yeah. yeah. Didn't he? Didn't he it move? It, it, it didn't. It budged. Oh, he did. It budged. It That's when Thor was like, "Uh, what's going on here? This <laughs> yeah. should not be happening." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was funny. That's a yeah. good. That's, that's a good, good, that's uh, a good analogy call, uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Mjolnir. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, I was gonna bring up the obvious choice with Harry Potter and yes. how the dark saber mm. becomes connected to you. Right. And how each one of the of the wizards in Harry Potter, they're they're they don't choose their wands; their wands choose them. Mm-hmm. Oh. So now that the dark saber is talking with Sabine, Sabine, for- and, and and her couple of midichlorians that are just waking up, or, <laughs> but but the dark saber senses that Sabine is understanding, like with uh, the Harry Potter wands. The ones know when, okay, this is the right person for me because this person fits my my personality as a wand. Yeah, it's hmm. really neat. And I think next week we're going to get a little more in-depth with that connection. It's, but also, are we familiar? Are you familiar with Lord of the Rings? Yeah, I've seen the movies. Oh, okay. Because I haven't, <laughs> but I've heard that there's a connection with Lord of the Rings as well. And unfortunately, I am not familiar with I that know, story. I know more about sports than I do with Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Well, at least you've seen Firefly now. 
Fuck you. Yeah, oh, yes. come on, come on. That yes. was waiting to happen. I, I mean, the ring does kind of call out to, um, oh my gosh, to Frodo. Okay. I mean, so we see Frodo having this relationship with the ring, which is good and helps him. If you haven't seen Lord, go see Lord of the Rings. It's yeah. great. It's phenomenal. Do I have to. I, I heard, <laughs> so apparently there is a Lord of the Rings connection as well uh, to, to swords. And the dark saber, and from Twitter, I want to thank Twitter for putting this in my head. Uh, <laughs> is that there's the story of Aragorn from Lord of the Rings, and the sword Narsil that was reforged into Underil. Wow. Okay. That's all I know about that. <laughs> However, I want to thank Rebels Report for uh, putting me onto that. All right. Now, now comes the big question. Wait, wait. Can we all take a moment? To mourn what would have been an amazing addition to Sabine's Disney Infinity gameplay. Oh, oh, After oh, this episode, oh. she could have leveled up to like level 10 and had the dark saber and wow. going psh, 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 in the game. It would have been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very sad. All right. Now, when watching Rogue One, I had a big question regarding dark saber. Because when Jin and Cassian are looking for the Death Star plans in the big archive shaft... They go through all these file names, and one of which was Dark Saber. Yeah. Hmm. So, how do we get from Trials of the Dark Saber episode to Rogue One? Now, my my sense of logic is that since Clan Ren, it, they believe in the Empire because hmm. the because when Sabine left, they thought she was a traitor because she didn't believe in the Empire. So, Clan Ren does believe in the Empire. So, when Sabine goes back to Mandalore. They maybe steal the dark saber from Sabine, thinking she's a traitor, so she can't have this powerful weapon, and they give it to the Empire, and that's how there's a they they hide it somewhere where in the archive there is the the location or hmm. something referring to hmm. dark saber. Okay, I have, a, I have a different opinion on that. I'm just thinking because the dark saber was forged by a Jedi and was in the Jedi archives at one time that that may be what that it's referring to. Cause if you think about it, the empire was forged from the old Republic, which had all those Jedi archives and everything. Hmm. So I would think that's just a relic of what has been left over huh. there. Right. But house Vizsla did steal the dark saber from the temple when, right. when during the fall of the, of the old Republic, are we, Which, do we know that's when yes, it happened? Yes, because oh. Pre Vizsla does say that to Obi-Wan in the Clone Wars. This lightsaber was stolen from your Jedi temple by my ancestors during the fall of the Old Republic. So okay. before the Empire got a chance to take it over and take command of the Jedi temple, that was stolen. So oh. they never got their hands on it. So if the Empire never got it at that point... I'm thinking there's a connection between House Wren stealing it from Sabine, giving it to the Empire, and that's why they have it they have it somewhere in their files. Okay. I mean it is also interesting that Palpatine does is aware of the existence of the Darksaber. I mean, A, he fights Maul with it in um in the Star Wars The Clone Wars. So Maul fights Darth Sidious then. And then also later in Darth Maul's son of Dathomir, we see again in the in there's a battle where Maul is using it and Darth Sidious is also involved in that battle. So it's possible that he was aware of its existence. I, I like the idea of them having it, hmm. and that's why there's the there's that file. There. Oh, you think they possess it? I think they possess it. It's okay. I mean, there. I, I mean, we ha- there's pretty much three different directions they can go from here. No, one- just one. <laughs> <laughs> one is that eventually the lights, the dark saber gets uh, out of Sabine's possession and into the Empire's possession, and just sort of locked away somewhere in some sort of archive. That's why I think it's house. It's Clan Wren. Uh huh. That does, but we, I'm yeah. sorry. Go on. Um, that's one. Another is the more boring thing, which is that at some point it gets destroyed, right? Maybe the handle gets slashed or broken, and um, whether it's in Sabine's possession or something else, and then there's a lesson. Or you know, put it's in the not fires just of Mordor or something, right, right? And then you know, the lesson to be learned is it's not just the the you know the weapon; it's also who possesses it. Da, da, da. Um, and then the third possibility is that it, you know somehow it it stays in Sabine or some other Mandalorian's possession, but outside of the Empire's possession. I mean, we still have the rest of this half season to to go, and I'm sure there. Hopefully, there will be more seasons. There's yeah, there's yeah, a lot hopefully. more storytelling. All right, now there's one more thing that was kind of confusing during this episode, and I don't think it's just me. Explain to me all about 
House Vizsla and how the houses and clans work in the Star Wars universe. Great. Thank you. So us fans haven't really been given a clear description, at least on screen, exactly what the houses are and how the clans are and how they all work. But what we do know is that there are multiple clans within houses. So, for instance, Sabine is from Clan Ren, House Vizsla. And, um, but one of the confusing elements is that once in Star Wars The Clone Wars and once in Star Wars Rebels, it's been described as Clan Vizsla. So mm. Fen Rao talks to Sabine in Star Wars Rebels and says, oh, you're, fr- you know, he's from Clan Vizsla, referring to Gar Saxon. And then also in Star Wars The Clone Wars, we see when uh, Pre Vizsla talks to Darth Maul, he says, I'm from Clan Vizsla. But since then, Pablo Hidalgo has clarified on Twitter, thank you, Pablo, that <laughs> <laughs> there's no really such thing as Clan Vizsla. There is a House Vizsla, and so there are multiple clans with, within that. So thus, you have Sabine being from Clan Ren and House Vizsla. Now, we haven't gotten the fuller story yet, um, but we're about to see more episodes with Mandalorians and Mandalore. Yeah. And so I wouldn't be surprised. That, actually, I kind of expect that they will fill us in a little bit more of who the different clans are, who the different houses are. Um, but we have seen, I'm not really clear whether the houses and clans are separate or intertwined with the Death Watch and the Protectors and any other Mandalorian groups out there. And that's another thing that is, at least on screen, has not yet been explained to us. Right. All right, that is a good primer as we move on. Yes. And unfortunately, the next episode of Rebels won't be airing until February 18th with Legacy of Mandalore. Now, before we play a clip from that episode, go ahead and tell everyone where they can get a hold of you. Great. Thank you, Richard and Sarah. So I've got a Star Wars blog website called StarWarsMaven.info, and I'm on Twitter and Instagram, both as Star Wars Maven, and you can find me there. Awesome. Well, Skywalkers, if you want to reach out, please reach out to Star Wars Maven. Drew, thank you. Thank you so much, Richard and Sarah. And thank you, Eli. Rockets! Rockets! I see them! Didn't you tell them who you were? That's probably why they're shooting at us. Shoutouts! Skywalker shoutouts! Which Skywalkers get props from here in Neverland? Who was tweeted out? Shout out! Who was photoball? Shout out! Who was shared a post? Shout out! All right, we had lots of shout outs on Twitter this week, so here we go. You ready? Ready. All right, we have a tweet walker at Use the Force Ray said. I enjoyed episode 153 a lot. Loved when you talked to Gus Lopez about his awesome collection. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. And if you're following Gus Lopez on Facebook, he's posting more daily grails. And today he just posted a plaster sculpt of R2-D2's head that they used to mold his head. Oh. For, I think it was for the test R2 units. But it... How do you get that? It's plaster. You know, plaster doesn't last that long. And when you drop it, it smashes into dust. Oh, man. So, yeah, that was amazing. And Marina Payne on Periscope just said that was her. So she is at Use the Force Ray on Twitter. So everyone follow oh, her. I'm glad you liked our Gus Lopez, our, our, our discussion. We'll have to have him on again because he's got so many things. And... Gus, like I keep saying to you, where do you get this stuff? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that plaster R2 head that they used for molding was just incredible. Because well, working in the creature de- effects department, that stuff does not last long. <laughs> All it takes is one tiny bump, and mm-hmm. it just shatters. Oh, man. All right, so make your notes on the stuff you want to talk to him about next time. All right. Okay, so also on Twitter. Now, Richard and I, Richard... Has been learning to tweet for the past couple of years. I have. It's so much fun. But now we, he actually has a reason to tweet. <laughs> so every Saturday when Star Wars Rebels is on, which is unfortunately not till February now, but we are live tweeting. So, Richard, and you're tweeting under Sith Rich. I know. I'm so excited. And have you liked it? I have been loving it. Tracy Okanobio has responded back. Uh... Matt Wood has responded. Oh, cool. Yeah, oh, the, that's right. The voice of the battle droids and General Grievous. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that was that. I can see how it. I can see how it, tweeting is addicting. Yes. But it's all the hashtags and ads and this and that and. But I'm here to help you. Yes, you are. Yes, yes, you are. So that that is a lot of fun. Yeah. So we were live tweeting Trials of the Dark Saber on Saturday night, and I tweeted out the question. Did we get any more backstory in previous Star Wars Rebels episodes about the relationship between Sabine and her parents? I was very interested in this. So, I got a great thorough response back from Jonna Marie Macias right away. And she is, of course, at Blue Jag Eyes on Twitter. And she said, in the first episode of Star Wars Rebels, Ezra asks her what brought her there, and she responds with, Family. She also mentioned her mom two times, once in Protectors of Concord Dawn and in Imperial Super Commandos. Nothing too elaborate, though. We only got hints here and there. She wasn't one to talk about it and kept it bottled up. So, well, holy buckets! <laughs> well, Tia almost spoiled something. Uh, was it was oh. at Star Wars Celebration Anaheim. When oh, really? She was starting to say something, but something very minor. And okay. then everyone ran with it. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't remember wh- what exactly it was, but I know it, people had t- had taken it and ran with it and made it into something it wasn't. So at the press conference, she had to tell everyone, hey, that's not what I was referring to. I was mm-hmm. just referring to that Sabine's got a mom and dad. Right, right, okay. <laughs> but when everyone heard Sabine's family, oh, 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 and they just went crazy. So if you guys have a question about Star Wars Rebels, ask ask Jonna Marie on Twitter, because she was right on that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And I wanted to mention that Christopher Marino, who is at Mental Madness, he tweeted out a Skywalker selfie of him at a zoo (laughs) in Australia. And behind him, as he was listening to our podcast, well, what was that behind him in the picture? It was a kangaroo. It was a kangaroo. It was a kangaroo. (laughs) But truth be told, he he, he wasn't in Australia. Yeah, he was. No, he he was in Burbank. Oh, okay. Yeah, Burbank just flooded with with kangaroos. (laughs) I'm just kidding about that. He really was in Australia. Yes. So, Skywalkers, if you're listening now, stop what you're doing, pull out your phone, and take a selfie, and say, and then tweet out and say, hashtag Skywalker selfie, this is what I was doing, yay, and do that. So, (laughs) we we love to see your Skywalker selfies. Now, the kangaroo may have been photobombing, wasn't quite sure. Okay. I want (laughs) to welcome Neatsan, who just joined us on Facebook. Hey, Hey. Nitsan. All right. And now, finally, our Facebook group has been thriving. It is full of fabulous, fun, family-friendly Skywalkers. We love you guys. And I just want to give a shout-out to Matthew Tapasio, who wrote in Facebook, He just watched Star Wars Rebels, Trials of the Darksaber, and I was really emotional and heartbroken over Sabine's past. And I gotta say, she's so inspiring, and that's another reason why she's my favorite character on the show. So, I wanted to give a shout out to Matthew and just let everyone know that our Facebook group is a great place to share your thoughts and your feelings about Star Wars, about Disney, about anything, and even create your own meetups, because I know there's many of you who do that. Yeah, there was just a, a meetup in Massachusetts. Yes, Amanda Bakken headed that up. Yeah. 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 So thanks, Amanda. Keep on bringing those those mass Skywalkers together. It was so cool. So, Skywalkers, if you have not yet joined our Facebook group and you would like to, what you have to do is search Facebook for Skywalking Facebook group. It should pop up. Request to join. Now, after you have done that, that is step one. Step two, you must find us in another place so either skywalking pod on twitter or our skywalking page and just message us and say hey i want to join the facebook group i am awesome and i love skywalking through neverland all right it's funny when they do follow the directions to join they'll say i'm not a weirdo yes oh i love it i love it so those are your directions if you haven't joined yet and you want to so please join our facebook group Yes, and then maybe you will get the coveted award of the Skywalker of the Week. (gasps) With that awesome segue, let's reveal this week's Skywalker Skywalker of of the the Week. week. Kaya, Kaya, Missy, Kaya, Missy, Kaya, Missy, Kaya. Congratulations to Missy Kaya. 
She is the Skywalker of the week. And I know you've joined us for some meetups and we are so excited to have you, Missy Kaya. And we want to thank Rob Dellinger, who wrote your awesome jingle this week. And as always, Rob Dellinger is... The John Williams of podcasting. Now, Skywalkers, if you want to be the Skywalker of the week, just tweet out to Skywalking Pod or Facebook post an episode of the show and just say how much you love Skywalking or make us laugh or do a Skywalker selfie or something and you may become the Skywalker of the week. Or just say that you want to become the Skywalker of the week. That's true. Mm -hmm. Add it to the list. One day, one day. Well, now... Let's welcome back Tom Amin and hear about his new album in Point Five Past Lightspeed. You're the busiest bee in the fan community. You get around the galaxy enthusiastically. You're Point Five Past Lightspeed. Our next guest is an accomplished pianist and composer. He has reinterpreted classic Disney songs and film music, including Star Wars, into piano compositions and full albums. And now, Tom Amin has just released his 17th album based on everyone's favorite Disney classics with Dreams Come True. Hey, hey, hey Tom. Tom! Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me back. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, of course. You know what? And you were on episode 102 of Skywalking Through Neverland when you, it was last year, you had just released your Star Wars inspired album. Oh yeah. That was called Journey to the Stars. And it was a Star Wars tribute album because as people know, I'm a huge Star Wars, you know, junkie. So I grew up watching it. I love the music from it. John Williams is my favorite composer, et cetera, et cetera. So I decided to do a solo piano album of my favorite Star Wars themes. So it was really good. I mean, I, I thought it turned out really well. I did a concert in which you guys actually came to yeah. that show. Yeah, right yeah. there in Hollywood. It was like the day before The Force Awakens opened. So it, yeah. was, it was a good rev up to the film. <laughs> yeah, that was a good week, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, it's all Star Wars. Like, we don't have those kind of weeks every single <laughs> other week. It's exactly. true. <laughs> exactly. Although we wish it could be every week, we'll, we'll take them when they come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, were we right? Is this your 17th album? <laughs> I think, you know, if you include the other, I guess, I don't, I don't, I, I was counting. Don't know. I was counting on your website and it looked okay. like this was number 17. Well, for so. all intents and purposes, it was 17. Yeah, you're very, okay. how about, you're That's, very prolific. Thank you so much. Well, I guess if you include, because I started doing albums, my first album came out in 1997. I think I was like 20 something. That was the first album I ever did. So I guess if you count all those CDs, yeah. I yeah. guess it's number 17. Awesome. And now your latest, Dreams Come True, is based on, on everyone's favorite Disney classics. What was the one song that inspired you to do this album? What inspired me was I'm, I'm really excited for the remake of Beauty and the Beast coming up. I'm, I'm really excited to see the live action film. Mm. Oh, yeah. And when I first found out they were doing it, at first I thought it wasn't going to have the music of the animated film. It was just going to be a live action film like kind of like the jungle book was right but when i saw the trailer and saw that they were using all the music from from the animated film i got really excited and uh beauty and the beast of course is one of my favorite disney uh films so i decided let's do an album this time of disney songbook music because of the other disney stuff i've done as you know is a uh, theme park rides which i love but i thought it's time to do some uh classic disney songbook uh, music. So I started with Beauty and the Beast. That was like the first song I recorded. The main Aww. theme because I'm like, I have to put this on there. And it's such a beautiful song to play. And it sounds really good on solo piano. So that's kind of what inspired me to do an album of uh, Disney songbook music. Well, and, that, and that just came out like a month ago, that trailer with yeah. the music. So you, you, wow. you're really quick. <laughs> well, I had been planning it for a while. So I, I kind of knew the... Uh, what songs I wanted to do. I, I had a general idea. This is what I want. I'd like to do something from Beauty. I would love to do something from Lion King and something from Little Mermaid. And I wanted to put a song from Newsies in there because the, the, I know it's so awesome. In the original Newsies soundtrack, I kind of wore out the CD. I listened to that all the time when, when it came out in the 90s. And it was so cool when it got revived or when it got put on Broadway. But uh, I wanted to do one of those. And then, of course... There was a surprise on this album, which I've never done. I haven't done since my first album, but I sing a song 
on this new one, like actually do vocals. Yes, so that you was kind do. of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and it's to everyone's favorite song from Peach Pete's Dragon. Dragon. Oh, and yeah. it's Candle on the Water. I'll be your candle on the water. My love for you will always burn. I know you're lost and drifting, but the clouds are lifting. Don't give up, you'll have somewhere to turn. I'll be your... Yeah, the, ori- the original Pete's Dragon. <laughs> yes. Which I remember, I, I listened to your show about the review. I found it hysterical. <laughs> Yeah. I thought it was very funny. Yeah, the original's trippy, but you know, as a kid, we loved it. Like mm-hmm. I was just a kid when that came out. Okay. And uh, I remember that was one of the first floats I saw on the Main Street Electrical Parade. I think when we were went oh. down to Disney the first time. So Pete's Dragon, it's just sentimental for me. But I've always loved Candle on the Water. I think it's a gorgeous song. The word you describe Pete's Dragon is trippy, huh? <laughs> I I could think of other words. <laughs> <laughs> That's not meant for this podcast. I, I know. I know. We're a family podcast here, so we can't, you know. But it, it's the movie is incredibly long. Like the original, yeah. it's too long. It's And then the people that abuse Elliot, like they're it's scary what they're talking. Like exactly what you yes. reviewed it. Yeah. Like it's like, wow, they're really saying this stuff, you know. But, yeah, they're singing very happy songs about child abuse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh my goodness. So would you say that this song has the deepest nostalgic impact for you? It does because Candle on the Water, I loved it when I first heard it. And then what happened was I started to sing it just for fun when I, it, when I was about 12 or 13 as I was getting older. And I just found that I really liked singing it. It fit comfortably with my voice. I mean, I'm not a singer. I'm just a pianist who sings, you know, oh, yeah. I'm not trained, not trained or anything, but I always felt really comfortable singing the song. I really like the words. I think it's got a really positive message and uh, I, I just love that song. And I know Helen Reddy did the original, and it just it brings back a lot of memories for me. I know what you mean by it feeling comfortable in your voice. Like I've always loved a whole new world because mm-hmm. I love singing it with the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Like the voice, your voice just soars, and it's just so much fun. So I can definitely uh, see what you mean there. Yeah, it's just one of those songs where if you sing along to, I mean, not everyone's going to feel that way. Everyone feels differently about different songs, mm-hmm. but it just feels like when you find a song that you just like to jam to or sing to, and it just feels comfortable, and you're like, I like singing the song, I love it, you know, and it sounds good to you, and it's just one of those songs for me. Right. Whenever I start singing, people always ask, can you sing Far, Far Away? Or can you stop? No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. And you know what? I, my grandfather used to always tell me What's that far, joke, far and I, I never really understood that. Can you oh. sing Far, Far Away? Oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> For years, wow. he would say that. It's like, I don't know that song. And it's like, one day, ah, okay, yeah, <laughs> oh I get it now. Goodness. I get it now. That's so terrible. Oh, that's hilarious. I know. Poor Richard. <laughs> I'm sure it's not that bad. Oh, 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 no. Oh, no. You haven't heard me. He can only sing Christmas carols. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everyone... Everyone gets a pass with Christmas carols. Yes. You know what I, you know what I mean? That's Everyone true. gets a pass. Well, I have a question for you, Tom. And <clears throat> sure. so you have a song on here called Out There. And I'm wondering yes. where that's from. Because I'm not familiar with that one. That is from the Hunchback of Notre Dame or Notre Dame as oh. we call it. But that was from the night when did that come out? Was it ninety six? Ninety seven. It was late nineties. Later nineties. I'd say ninety five. Was... No, ninety six, because ninety five was Pocahontas. Okay. You're right. It, it was after Pocahontas, so it was ninety six. Got it. It was when I was uh, in my high school too cool for Disney phase. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, I fell in love again, I fell in love with that music. I think that's one of Alan Macon's best scores, dramatic wise, because it's so complex. The songs are really they're very Broadway esque, but they're very um soaring and moving they're really huge even the background soundtrack uh to the to the movie has like all those latin chants in it and it's really complex i really love the music for that now that was not a big that was not a big hit for disney and it was i i see why it was darker it really wasn't a kid's movie right you know it was really more adult uh but I love that score. But Out There was one of my favorite ballads from that movie where um, Quasimodo sings about how he wants freedom, even if it's just for one day. You know, he wants to experience what it's like to be among the people. And I just thought that was so inspiring because I know we've all felt that. I felt that way every now and then about just wanting, you know, 
wanting a dream to come true or I want this relationship to work or I want this career move, just something that even for a day, I'd love to experience that. I think it's just something innate Mm -hmm. that, uh, I really related to. Well, I think you did a great job translating that. And let's another Alan Menken score that is amazing and didn't get to sing its praises back in the 90s is Newsies. Yes. So I yes. was super excited that you had seized the day on here because I have been, a, a, <laughs> what is it? Not a newsy, a groupie. What do they call them? <laughs> Stalker? Uh, no, like a Newsy <laughs> fan from the very beginning. And she she's played your rendition of Seize the Day like 30 <laughs> times a day. No joke. Oh, cool. So, oh, uh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I, I'm so happy that you chose to include Seize the Day on your album. Include, and it is the last final song. Well, I first of all, I'm with you, Sarah. I mm. love Newsies. The day that CD came out, I... I played that CD to death. I loved all the music. I loved even the scoring. Remember they had some instrumentals on there as well. That's why I put, if you listen to the song, there's an instrumental from the original Newsies uh, movie called uh, Rooftops. And I put that theme in there. Oh, that's so cool. It's in there. So, but Seize the Day was just a great song. Uh, uh, just like a get up and go get them kind of song when, when uh, the, the boys are trying to revolt against the newspaper and like, create a first strike but it was this whole song of anthem of seizing the day together standing together as one uh to bring about some kind of change it's just such a cool inspiring song question for you and that sure. is while you were transcribing this particular song to piano did you discover anything about the chords or the rhythms that make it just so catchy i just think it's that whole alan mink and he has this way of just creating this one phrase that you can repeat over and over again but it never gets old mm. it's super catchy it's just like da 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 okay. and it's that rhythm that he repeats throughout most of the song ba ba da 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 Right. That's kind of like what he did with Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast has that one form uh, throughout the whole song, like ba 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 ba, da 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 da. That whole phrase is the whole song. The whole song is those little phrases put together, okay. uh, those, those rhythms. So I thought "Seize the Day." That's what I really like about it. It's got this snap, catchy little uh, tune that I think is so hummable, and it doesn't get old. Well, okay. to me, it doesn't get old. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> to me, I think there's something about the openness of those opening chords, the fifths yeah. that's, that are used yeah. and stuff that just draw me in. I think that that's reminds true. me of John Williams, too, because he used a lot of those. Yeah, that's true. The open <laughs> fifths. Yeah, I didn't want to get, like, technical with the music. I didn't well, that's know. okay. We can People get a little glaze technical. over when they, you know, they, <laughs> but yeah, it's the fifths. It's the sixth. It's the harmonies that are used there. And mm-hmm. it's just a great tune. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I'm sure when you were done with the whole album, you were thinking, oh, I, I wish I could have included this song or this song or this song or this <laughs> song. Do you have uh, any plans for a, a follow-up, maybe including yes. more from Newsies? <gasps> yes, I do plan on doing a follow-up and a longer album as well. This one was a little bit short. Um, it had all the songs that I wanted to do, and I, I really felt like it was a good, complete package. But I definitely want to do a longer album next time, and I have a lot more songs that I want to do including something from Newsies, but I don't want to give it away just yet. Oh, okay. oh yeah? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> in time, in time, Richard. No one ever falls for that. <laughs> would, you in- would you include any themes from the Pixar films? Ooh. I would love to do that. That's what I was thinking of because I love the theme to Up. Mm. I love the theme, the Finding Nemo 
is like that little basic piano theme is gorgeous. Uh, I love the Incredibles. I don't know if there's a way to do some of that on solo piano. It'd be interesting to to tool yeah. around with it and see. But the Pixar themes are are great. I actually I could do a whole album of just Pixar themes. I mean, they're oh, so oh, good. There you go. I think there's an <laughs> audience there. <laughs> I know. Oh I have Toy Story and oh, you know so what? Much good stuff. It would be awesome to do like a dueling pianos Incredibles. Oh, that would be so cool. Because I think you'd almost need, you know, four hands for that one. (laughs) That would be cool. Well, you know, because of modern technology, I could make You've got four hands? (laughs) With the Pro Tools. Oh, okay. Got it. Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) That's a cool idea, though, Sarah. I kind of like that. Maybe do piano overlays. I never do that, you know, but maybe piano overlays might be kind of interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Interesting. You heard it. You heard it right here first on Skywalking Through Neverland. <laughs> That's right. You no, know, I know. Last time you were on, we were talking about maybe trying to plan something where we had like a dueling piano night. Oh I, yeah. I still think that can and should happen. I think that's. I love that idea. I, you know, it's been, I've, I've dual piano just a couple times, but it's been years, Richard. I mean, years ago I did that. <laughs> I think it'd be very cool. It would be cool to piano duel a whole night of Disney stuff, you know? Yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Disney or Star Wars, Duel of the Fates yes, versus Imperial yes. March. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, versus God, Seize the Day. Oh. Yes. <laughs> oh, this is, this. Duel, duel of the Fates would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so We're on to something here. Yeah, right. I really right. think we are. <laughs> we're gonna make we're gonna make this happen. We're gonna hold on. I'm gonna make this note. All right, duly <laughs> noted. Yeah, you know what? I I know we talked about this last time regarding rights. Oh. Did, did you have to pass this by Disney to get the rights to do this album and and sell it? Yes, because you can't – yes, what you have to do is contact them, and then you give them the list of songs that you would like to to do. And what they do is they just go through them and give you permission. Uh, and then the – but the, the thing is you can't use any uh, imaging or likeness of Disney when you're doing these independent albums because it's not a Disney-sanctioned album. Mm. So you can't use their – like their Disney fonts or anything like that. And they do have to approve the artwork cover before you're allowed to sell it. Okay. So that's really all there is to it. That's why I couldn't put – I originally had like songs from Disney, something like Disney, and they said, well, we don't really want you to use the word Disney. I said, okay, that's fine. Gotcha. So I'll put Dreams Come True, like stuff like that. So, But the guy that I've worked with for many years, he's really cool. He gets back to me right away, and he knows that I do these albums. So they're pretty good about getting back to me. Uh-huh. And then, uh, then you'll have to do is register like – I use a, a service called CD Baby, which I know you know about because Rob's album is on there. Yes. So I do CD Baby and then uh, upload everything, and then CD Baby sends it out to iTunes and all those online uh, stores. Nice. Wow. Yeah. So it's not Disney sanctioned, but they gave you the thumbs up. They give you the thumbs up, and then what you do is you pay in advance for a certain amount of downloads, like let's say 200. Hmm. So I will pay in advance for 200 downloads, and that gives the oh. money to them and to the to the writers and all that kind of stuff. Then, like if the album sells really well, anything over 200 downloads, then I owe royalties to them. But it's not a lot. I mean, it's like – I think it's like 10 cents for the writers get per – per dollar. Uh, it's something like that. So y- you have to pay every quarter. You pay them some royalties. But I, I don't mind it at all. I'm really a big believer in paying people for their work and their music. And I- I'm not really a big... You know, a lot of people download files for free. I'm actually one of those dorks that actually pays. Like, I just... <laughs> I go to iTunes and I pay because I want to support people that I really like. So I-, I don't mind doing that at all. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So... For this album, Dreams Come True, what is the feeling you want your fans to come away with after they've heard it? I think I want fans to come away with a feeling of uh, possibility, like your dreams can come true. Mm-hmm. Uh, keep keep dreaming, dream big. Uh, I know we've all heard these cliche phrases before, but they mean something really different when you actually believe it in your heart and in your mind. It, it's It's a big difference for someone to say, you know, I'm dreaming of doing this. Well, now I have the uh, audacity to go do it, you know, to let's try to pursue it, to go do whatever you want to do. Uh, I just hope people 
come away with that feeling of, yes, dreams can come true. And also just so it's a nice, relaxing album, you know, that people can just chill out to or zone out after a long day at work or like in the car. I know some people listen to my music in the car because it keeps them calm yes. when they're driving. <laughs> Yes. You should have called this the perfect L.A. driving soundtrack. <laughs> oh, I know, because here in Los Angeles, I mean, I listen to classical music a lot because it just mm-hmm. keeps me calm. Yeah. Because driving in L.A., is, as you know, is, is awful. So, But I, it's, <laughs> I want people to have that kind of reaction to it, like a really nice, relaxing, this feels good kind of album. You should have dedicated each track to, hey, you out there in the 405, it's 5 o'clock, this is for you. <laughs> this one's for you. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think people will come away with that feeling, ending it with Seize the Day, definitely. I love it. It's just great. I, I mean, I had so much fun recording it. And I always, when you're recording these songs, you just kind of hope that you're doing them justice and that people will like them. Uh, you know, because I record basically in my apartment and I have Pro Tools and, and sounds like stuff like that. But when you're kind of in a bubble like that, you really don't know how people are going to react till it goes out into the world, you know? So I've been very lucky and so thankful that people have responded really positively to my style of music. It's been really, really uplifting for me. Awesome. Well, you know what? Can you remind our Skywalkers where they can find your album? Sure. You can go, if you go to my website, Tom Amin, and that's A-M-E-E-N, TomAminMusic.com, there's links there to all the sites where it's available, but you can just, I mean, it's on iTunes, it's on Google Play Store, it's on Amazon.com, it's also on CD Baby, and if you just type in, if you go to iTunes and type in Tom Amin, all the albums come up and Dreams Come True is will come up for sure, so it's pretty easy to find. All right, now, as a tease, can you tell the Skywalkers what you're working on next and when you expect that to come out? I do want to work on another Disney album, so I want to do that. I want to do, like I said, a longer album with a lot more music, so I'm going to do that. And I'm hoping that could come out in the summertime or the fall at the latest. But also, what I want to try to do this year, a lot of people have told me, do a, a Christmas album. And I've never done one, so yes. I might be doing one of those this year as well. I think, honestly, like, I, I <laughs> hunger for Christmas music. Like, every Christmas, I, I go and look around for, like, albums I can download or, or stuff that I can mm-hmm. uh, build my Christmas library. So I think that's an awesome idea. Cool. I feel the same. I always, I'm always looking for new stuff, you know, to add to my library. Definitely. I think it's fantastic. Now, I know I, I loved your episode of Christmas in the Stars because <laughs> I had that album. I was like, oh, my God, when did that come out? When was that out? 81? 1980. 1980. 1980. <laughs> I was 11 years old. My parents bought me the album for Christmas, and I fell in love with it. It's hilarious because <laughs> now that you look at it as an adult and you hear the songs, you're like, like what you said, like, what are they saying here? This is kind of <laughs> stupid. But I love, I can't help it. I put it on every, now I have the CD, and I just put it on every Christmas. I can't help it. Oh, <laughs> good. You, you hear a C-3PO sing? Yeah. Yeah. How do you pass that up? And <laughs> how, do you not, how do you not make that a yearly tradition? I know. I got. I love the sleigh ride with R2 singing yes. at the end. I just, I love it. So uh, You did it, I, R2! I, you did it! <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But yeah, so hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm looking into doing a Christmas album this year. But again, but I'm going to do another Disney album next. And, and I'm really excited for some of the ideas I have. Awesome. Well, we look forward to it. And please let us know when that comes out. And also, where can our Skywalkers find you on social media? I am at Tom, I'm on mostly on Twitter. That's my main thing. Uh, Tom Amin. That's my name. T O M A M E E N. Just one word at Tom Amin. And I'm also on Instagram, but I think it's Tomster88. It's not my name on Instagram, but you know what? I, I have all is. those links on my website. Okay. Oh, is it Tomster88? Okay, <laughs> I can't remember. Okay, but the main thing is Twitter. Twitter is my main my main thing where I where I post stuff. I hear you. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tom, so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I listen to you guys all the time. I love the podcast. You guys lately have been, the interviews have been spot on. I'm really a fan of your show, so I'm really happy that I was back here. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. And always remember, dreams dreams come come true. true. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) That wasn't even rehearsed either. No.
Well, that wraps up episode 154 of Skywalking, Skywalking Through, Through Neverland. Neverland. We would like to give out a big thanks to Joe Costa Drew, a.k.a. Drew Kaplan, Tyler Westhouse, and Tom Amin, as well as all you Skywalkers, for taking the time out of your schedules and listening week in and week out and sharing with a friend. Because according to our download numbers, our episodes are going way, way up. So we want to thank everyone for, for sharing with a friend. Absolutely. Now, Skywalkers, we have a podcast soundtrack. Rob Dellinger has released an album on iTunes and all digital platforms, and it is called Skywalking Through Neverland Awesome Jingle Mix Volume 1. So, if you're looking for an awesome Valentine's Day present... All you have to do is download that album and you will be supporting Rob Dellinger and all he does for our show. I love the way you work in presents all the time. <laughs> hey, it's true. It's very, very true. Now, Skywalking meetups are coming, you guys, including our Skywalking Disney cruise to Baja, Mexico. This is September 17th through 22nd, 2017. It is a five-night cruise on the Disney Wonder sailing out of San Diego. So we only have, we have less than a dozen spots left. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Let's, a couple of more people have joined yeah. the cruise. Yeah, we're so excited. Yeah, so it's, it's getting filled up now. It is. And it's going to be a Halloween on the high seas cruise. Oh, oh stop it. Stop oh, it. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be amazing. So to get more info, please email our friend, podcaster, and cruise buddy, Randy Crane, at cruise at storiesofthemagic.com to get a free no obligation quote and some more information and just email him and let him know you're with Skywalking Through Neverland so he knows you want to be part of our group and he can schedule us all together for eating times and for various events that we may be doing. Yeah, and in a couple of weeks he's going to be going on a a tour (gasps) of the brand new Disney well, the, the brand new refurbished. Refurbished, yeah. Wonder. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's going to be so much fun to, to hear firsthand what this ship is going to be like. Yeah. Oh, so much fun. And, and the whole t- cruise, you get to hear me call it the Oneater. <laughs> that's a joke that'll just never get old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's funny. Skywalker of the Week discount. <laughs> oh, you have to ask Randy. Yeah. Yeah. Let's <laughs> leave, leave that ball in his court. Yes. All right. Now, speaking of being a ball in a court, we are part of the Retro Zap family, where you can find other awesome shows like Brews and Blasters, Beltway Banthas, The Deuce Cast Movie Show, Techno Retro Dads, and Talking Apes TV, which will be coming out in just a couple of weeks, since Mark and I just recorded yesterday, and it was one of the only episodes we didn't fight the whole way through. Yeah. So it'll be very easy to edit together for him. Also, I want to mention that RetroZap has a great stable of writers who write some thoughtful pieces and some weekly pieces on Star Wars and other geek things. So it's a really good site to just look around and read different things and just be inspired in your fandom. Here, here. All right. Now, to get in touch with us all throughout the week, we are at Skywalking Pod for Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. And just to let you guys know, Richard is at Sith Rich on Twitter, so tweet at him. I am now. And I am at Jedi Tink on Twitter and Instagram, so you can tweet at me, girl things, or other things too, but you know, I do girly things on Jedi Tink. And also, you can email us, share at skywalkingthroughneverland.com. As well as leaving a review on iTunes. Love the reviews. We want to hear what you people have to say, for better or for worse. We're not going to tell you to leave us a five-star review because we want you to be honest. That's true. Now, with that, stay tuned for bits of conversations and outtakes that didn't make it into this show, as well as lots of bloopers. (laughs) So listen to that. But first and foremost, always remember... Never land on Alderaan. To our Skywalkers and Tweetwalkers, thanks for listening. Skywalking Through Neverland is created and produced by Richard and Sarah Woloski. Original music by Rob Dellinger. Creative consultant, Mark Ogushwitz. Technical advisor, Peter Heitman. 
Facebook administrators Donald Wicks, Joey Pittman, and Norma Heitman. Skywalking Through Neverland is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Any sounds, music, and clips played during this podcast are the property of their copyright holders. All original content is property of Skywalking Through Neverland, all rights reserved. Sorry, had to be said. Wait, say that. Our Our first first blooper blooper of the day. day. Does does my hair look like I'm wearing a toupee? I hope not. Well, you're not. No. Okay. I can mess it up for you. (laughs) The Donald Trump special I'm wearing right here. (laughs) No. All right, all right, all right. And here we go. Tyler Westhouse on things. Hold on. We got to fix that because we're going to do the Oscars separately. Just kidding. (laughs) <laughs> Wrong fandom. All right, let's do that one more time because then we're going to mention the uh, uh, her universe. Oh, okay. So many, so many last minute additions to things we want to share. Yes. Okay. All right. So. Uh, so. Okay. Let's. We're going to go back to this part right over here. Well. Okay. So hold on. Time out. So. Look at that. You think we we're pros? All oh, right. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Wait, dun, dun. we finished things we want to share. But we have to do the outro the song. The outro of things we want to share. Yeah, okay. Which goes... Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> you stop that. All righty. You want to play with Ray? Put her back in the box and I will. <laughs> Hey, everyone, I'm Ray. I want to go back in the box. What the heck kind of accent was that? That was the accent you hear when she's out of the box and she's very frustrated. <laughs> How do you play with her in the box? Good point. Dark you get the Tuba. box and you go bum, 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 bum. Good point. All right. Uh, Come on. All right. Bye. Uh, righty. So let's get into shout outs. Skywalker, Skywalker shout out. out. It is getting weird. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. You know what's later on in the day than we usually <laughs> do this? British part Australian. Yeah. Thanks, Wait, Adam. You know what? The most used quote we've been using from Rogue One. I understand. I understand. I understand. Jim, everything I do is to protect you. Say you understand. I, I understand. understand. Time. All right. Things. I mean, uh, things we want to shout out. Shout out. <laughs> Matt has to find some more action figures for us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Matt, Patty Hammond just said, you got to find more action figures yeah. for us. We're, yeah, we're very loopy. Had a long day. Yes. Uh, is, Matt uh, still, is Matt still here? Matt Clifton? No, he had to leave. Well, congratulations to Missy Kaya. That's right. And thank you. Oh, bleh. I'm sorry. You start that All again. Right. As always, Rob Dellinger is... This... <laughs> The John. Last week's episode of Star Wars Rebels Trials of the Dark Saber is being hailed as the best yet. Sabine is asked to set up and face her past. Step up. Step up. And now Tom Amin has just released his 17th album based on everyone's favorite Disney classics. Disney's. Disney's classics? No, favorite Dis- Disney classics. Yeah. I keep on saying. I, you keep on saying, saying Disney's. Disney's. Yeah, okay. We need a dance, a, sky, a Skywalker shuffle. Well, it's the Hoojib Hop. Yes. That's our dance. Coming soon to a celebration near you. We really need to flesh that out, don't we? So, yeah. So, like we were just saying, for uh, for Sunday, the Sunday in April, uh, the, that, that's Easter Sunday. Yeah. The 16th, 16th 17th. That morning, we're going to be doing an, a, a Hoojib Hop. Yeah. All around the convention. Yes. We're going to gather in a group. We got things planned, but we want to we want to flesh it out just a little bit more. Yes. How long did Empire take place over? I remember, like, in the movie, it makes it seem like it's two weeks, but I know it's supposed to be like months at a time or something like that. That Luke is on Dagobah. Yeah, I had heard, and I don't remember where that Luke was on Dagobah for three months. Huh. I think I think part of that was because it wasn't the uh, Millennium Falcon's like hyperdrive core or something broken so they had to fly from hoth to bespin right. yeah and like regular time yeah they couldn't do that three minute hyperspace yeah. jump right i believe that i believe that's what it was there you there go there you go print <laughs>